everybody. I'm just going to show myself very temporarily here. I'm, I'm zooming from my house. So what I'm going to do is uh, silence my video so that I can focus on the sound quality as well as the quality of my presentation here on my other screen. I just wanted to say hello so you can see my picture. My plan is at the end of this presentation to bring my video back so that you can see me as I attempt to answer your questions. One of the things I'd like to encourage you to do is if you have questions throughout my talk, it would be great if perhaps you could put those questions in the chat box towards the bottom of your screen. Again, the chat box towards the bottom of your screen, you can just ask me questions that way. So let me introduce myself. My name is Jamie Ellis. I am a professor at the University of Florida. So that that university is, uh, if there is a middle of Florida, we are in the middle of Florida. You know, it's kind of a weird shaped state. It's got a panhandle and then a peninsular part, but we're smack in the middle of Florida. The state of Florida is a very populated state. I think we have nearly 20 million people in our state now. It's a very popular uh, state for retirees. It's also a popular state for internationals to visit. So probably many of you have been here. So University of Florida is a really good institution in the US. I think we're ranked number uh, six, I believe at the moment of the hundreds and hundreds of, of public institutions that we have in the US. And I specifically work in the entomology and nematology department. So um, entomology is the study of insects, nematology is the study of nematodes. Our entomology department is also really good. And I'm, I'm the faculty member there who, who works with honeybees. And specifically, I work in the honeybee extension uh, and research laboratory. So I was very fortunate enough a few years ago, and I forget how many years now, but I was one of your speakers at the Gormiston um, Bee School that you have every summer. I, I brought my second son with me. My wife and I have four children, and my second son, Jude, and I were both there and really enjoyed my time. I told my wife that I was going to try to do my best possible talk here this evening, so you might have me back someday. <laughs> I'm trying to talk her into, into going with me, but um, as I get into this talk, again, let me know if you have questions. Put those in the chat box, and it's, it's, it's truly my pleasure to be able to speak with you tonight. I'm, I'm excited to join you. I understand that you guys have all just, uh, we're locked down again. I hear the weather is not so great there. So I encourage you all to get your favorite bowl of ice cream or perhaps pop you some popcorn and just sit back and watch the American election if you want something to entertain you here over the next few weeks. All right, without further ado, what I would like to do is I would like to talk to you tonight uh, about the task of worker honeybees. And I hope that this title doesn't throw you off and make you think that this is going to be boring. I do my, I'm do my, i going to do my absolute best to keep your attention. I can't see you, you can't currently see me, but I hope you can see my PowerPoint title slide where it says worker honeybee task. I believe it was advertised as worker honeybees and what they do. So I've given this talk a few times in, in the past six or eight months on Zoom and, and my talk attendees seem to really enjoy it. So let's get started. And if for some reason I go mute or if for some reason my video goes out, just, just let me know and I'll be happy to try to troubleshoot on this end. All right, with that said, let's jump straight into this. You know, I don't wanna just spend time talking to you. I want you to learn something from what I'm going to share. It's important to me that at the end of the day, you guys are able to take home some information. And the information specifically that I want you to learn from this talk is to be able to recognize the general order of tasks that worker bees perform as they age and identify some worker bee tasks that are independent of age. Now, all of you are probably very versed on this topic. I get that. This is one of those basic topics that a lot of beekeepers know from the beginning, but I hope to introduce you to some things that, that you'll find interesting throughout. And also at the very end of this talk, I'm going to show you on the internet how to navigate to a page where I have a document that basically says everything that I'm going to tell you this evening. So if you're scrambling to take notes, just know that I'm going to point you out to a good source of notes on this talk at the very end of this presentation. I'm going to take you to my lab's website and show you how to get information relative to this talk, relevant to this talk. All right, so 
The title of the talk, right, is The Task of a Worker Honeybees. But, but, but before I get you there, I want to tell you a little bit about worker honeybees. Now, again, I recognize, I see here now there's 183 individuals on the talk. That's what I see. And, and I realize that a lot of you are pretty well versed in this, but I want to go over some things that kind of really set the stage for where we're headed with this, because this, this is this slide by itself, I have spoken hours on. I find this concept utterly fascinating, right? A queen honeybee can lay an egg. We know that. We're beekeepers. We know this. And that egg can be fertilized or unfertilized. I give another talk on the mating biology of honeybees, and people really seem to enjoy that talk. But so I'm not going to tell you all of it tonight, but, but suffice to say, when a queen lays an egg, she has a store of semen in her body. So when she lays that egg, she can elect to re release semen and fertilize that egg or withhold semen, and, and that egg will remain unfertilized. Now, honeybees have what we call a haplodiploid sex determinant system. That means the sex of the bee is determined whether or not the egg is haploid or diploid. That's what that fancy phrase means, haplodiploid sex determinant system. So we know unfertilized eggs are haploid. They have half the set of chromosomes. They, these, these eggs only receive genetic input from their mom. So as a result, they become males. So the sex, the male, is produced from a haploid egg. The female sex is produced from a diploid egg because it's fertilized. That female egg has both a male contribution and a female contribution. And what's amazing to me is that queen honeybees can only make that egg male or female. They can't make that egg queen or worker. Once they lay a fertilized egg, it is the responsibility of the adult female nurse bees in the hive to either feed the resulting female offspring a lot of high quality food or less low quality food with the former producing a queen and the latter producing a worker. Now, I don't know if this is fascinating to you or not, but that last fork in the tree, that fork right there, whether that egg is fertilized and, and, and the offspring is well-fed or not well-fed is stunningly fantastic biology. I want you to think about this for just a second. That same female offspring has all of the genetic information necessary to be a queen or a worker. So workers are basically underfed queens, and queens are basically overfed workers. Now, if I were to give these two bees to any random schmo off the street, that person will look at them and say, hey, these are two different insects. They're different species of insects, but as beekeepers, you know they are, in fact, the same species. They're both Apis mellifera. But queens look a lot like wasps, so the random person off the street would probably say that this is a wasp and this is a honeybee. But in reality, two completely different morphologies, two completely different body forms come from the same genetic information. Not only that, workers live six weeks, queens live a couple years. So two completely different longevities result from the same DNA. Not only that, but worker bees have all of these behaviors that I'm going to tell you about in this talk, but queens their most complicated behavior is mating. Thereafter, their most complicated behavior is sticking their head in a cell and determining if it's ready or not to receive an egg. Yet the queen, the queen has all the genetic material necessary to have done the tasks that workers do and vice versa. It is utterly fascinating how two organisms that are otherwise so different have exactly the same genes. And this is where the field of epigenetics was born. Epi means above, genetics means gene, right? Above the gene. And for those of you who are already interested in tuning me out, I promise this is the most complicated slide that we will visit during this talk. 
So epigenetic, something that is above the gene. Now, I'm not with you in your room. You're not with me in my room. So what I'm about to tell you to explain epigenetics is going to require your absolute focus and concentration. All right. Imagine that we are all sitting in a large hall. And I'm the speaker, so I'm at the front. And let's say that this hall is symmetrical. So if I'm at the front of that hall and I'm standing in the very center of it, if I look up to the ceiling, the right half and the left half is exactly symmetrical. What you see on the right half occurs in mirror image on the left half. So let's just say for the sake of argument that if I look up as the speaker, I see two lights to my right on the ceiling and two rights to my left. A little further back, I see two lights to my right and two lights to my left, and so on to where, let's say, on the upper right half, there's five pairs of lights. On the upper left half, there's five pairs of lights. Now, and keep using your imagination. Imagine still the first pair of lights on my upper right is controlled by a light switch on the wall on my right, and the first pair of lights on my upper left is controlled by a light switch on the wall on my left. Go down the ceiling with all of the pairs of lights having their own light switch. So, now this is the simple part. The, light, the first light switch on my right and the first light switch on my left control pairs of lights that are otherwise the same intensity, can stay on or not for the same length of time, etc. with the same being true for the second pair on either side and the third pair and so forth. Now, imagine I asked you all to leave the room. And while you were gone, I went down the right wall and flipped on light switches one, two, and three, but left off four and five. And then I went to the left side and switched off one, two, and three, but left on four and five. I want to make sure I said that correctly. So on the right wall, I switched on one, two, and three, but left off four and five. On the left, I switched off one, two, and three, but left on four and five. And to make it where when you came into the room, you couldn't mess with those light switches, I put a box over all of them. So when you come in and you sit down and you look up, the two halves of the room have completely different lighting patterns. Now, the right half and the left half could have been the same. I could have turned them all on, turned them all off, only turned the front pair on, the front pair off, etc. But with the same switches controlling the same intensity of lights, I was able to create two different light patterns on both halves of the room. And what's more, because I put boxes on those switches, you can't do anything to stop me. You have just set through an entire semester of epigenetics. Because that's exactly how queens and workers work. They both have the same genes. And what makes the difference between the two Bs is not different genes, but it's the turning on and off of the genes that they share. And remember, I told you the word epigenetic, epi means above, there's something above the gene controlling the expression of that gene. Well, I flipped those switches on or off, and I put a box on those switches, and now you can't manipulate them. That box has locked that gene in expression or not. That box is the something above the gene that is controlling the expression of that gene. So when worker bees or queen bees are young and they're all the same female larva, the diet that they are fed starts controlling what genes are turned on and off. And there's tags placed on those genes that render them on or off. So with the same DNA, you create two completely different organisms absolutely stunningly fascinating. People who are studying the biology of aging use honeybees as a model since some genes create an organism that lives six weeks and other genes create an organism that lives years. Or some genes give an organism the ability to produce wax, but some genes stop an organism from producing wax and own and own and own. I could go on 
for days about this concept. But the best way that I've learned to explain it is, is using lights in an auditorium where both halves of the room could be lit the same, but they're not because different patterns of switches are turned on and off. So now you know everything you need to know about epigenetics. And born out of this fork in the road is the worker honeybee. So let's look at how this works. So the queen lays an egg. Out of that egg comes young larvae. Those young larvae are fed brood food for X number of days of their lives. Once they have finished eating, the worker bees will cap over their cells. The larva will stand up in those cells and become what we call pre -pupae. Then their bodies will start to differentiate and you start getting pupae. And then of course, if it's a worker honeybee, 21 days later, you get the emergence as an adult bee. Now, you know, I've been a beekeeper for 31 years and, and nearly everything I've ever learned about honeybees fascinates me. But it's incredibly fascinating to me that you can go from an egg to an adult bee while passing through a worm stage in 21 days. And everything that needs to be in that bee is pre-packaged in that bee to make her uh, contribute to the successful growth and function of a colony. Now, we almost always talk about bees once they emerge from their cells. But their development is a thing of beauty as well. I don't have time to go into much detail about this with you, but I like to use a boring old table to explain it. Honeybees are insects, and all insects as they grow have to shed their skin. Their exoskeleton cannot grow with them. So most people don't know that as a worker honeybee grows, she sheds her skin. The reason you don't see it when they are adult bees is adult insects do not shed their skin. The last shedding of their skin is what produces the adult and they never shed again. Now in science, that shedding of the exoskeleton is called molting. I believe Americans spell it M-O-L-T and the rest of the world spells it M-O-U-L-T. And while that worker honeybee is developing, she goes through a few molts. She sheds her skin multiple times. So I created this table to help you understand it. And in this table, the life stage in column A undergoes the developmental activity in column B to become the life stage in column C. So out of the egg, a larva emerges and you get what we call the first instar larva. The word instar simply means period of development between molts. So the first instar larva molts the first time to become a second instar larva. The second instar larva grows and molts to become a third instar larva. The third instar larva molts to become a fourth. The fourth molt, the fourth larval molt, molt happens under a capped cell when the bee becomes a prepupa. The fifth molt happens under a capped cell, at which point that worker becomes a pupa. And the sixth time they shed their skin ushers in their adult bee existence. That last molt, the molt that goes from a pupa to an adult bee is what we call eclosion. And believe it or not, worker bees are adults about a day and a half before they emerge from their cells. We always say things like they emerge as an adult. They, they're an adult when they emerge, but they actually shed their pupil skin about a half a day to a day and a half before they chew out of the capping of their cell. All right. Now, here's the real part of the presentation. Here's what I was really brought on to talk to you about. All of that was where do honey worker honeybees come from? This is what do worker honeybees do? I worked with a student to make sure that we have high quality images to show you in this presentation from this point forward. 
it was very important to me that if I was going to give talks about bees that we have really stunningly good images. So that PhD student's name was Mike Bentley. I hope you enjoy the pictures that you see from henceforth. All right, here we go. At this point, worker honeybees begin to do things. They're no longer larvae that just sit around and eat. They're no longer pupae that just sit around and do nothing. They're adult bees that have purpose in their existence. They have been born into a colony that needs their contribution in order to ensure the health and productivity of the colony. Now, worker bees are not born into a task in which they remain their whole life. They're not born to be only nurses. They're not born to be only guard bees and so forth. Instead, they subscribe to a system that we call temporal polyethism. Now, scientists love to make big words out of roots of words, but this is really simple. Temporal means time, poly means many, ethism means behavior. So timed many behaviors, or as beekeepers call it, age-related division of labor. That means worker bees change their job as they age. Their behaviors, their many behaviors, are timed. They're age-related. Now, this by itself is an incredible phenomenon because worker bees do so many amazing things. And again, while I talk to you, I want you to contrast the complexity of the worker honeybee with the relative boringness, boringness of, of queen bees. You know, we always emphasize the glory of the queen bee. She's so great. She's one in 50,000. She lays all the eggs, but she's so boring. Worker honeybees are where all the action really is. So let's talk about this in some detail. I, I once wrote a column for the American Bee Journal, which is one of our two large national magazines, and, and it was based on the biology of bees. And I did a lot of research on worker honeybee tasks because I wanted to be relatively accurate when I was writing to our, our, our beekeeper readership. And as a young beekeeper, I read all the books, you know, honeybees subscribe to temporal polyethism. They have all of these age-related division of labor. As they age, they progress through these tasks in a predictable manner. They do all the tasks, et cetera. But what I discovered in my research is this age-related division of labor is in fact not rigid. The workers can skip tasks. They might perform multiple tasks while they are the same age they can complete the tasks of different age groups. And what's even more interesting is that workers of all ages actually spend most of their time resting or patrolling the hive to find out what needs to be done rather than doing something at all. I always tell people if we called worker bees by what they really do, we would call them resters and not workers. And everybody says, now, Jamie, that's not possible. I look into a bee colony and everybody's moving. And I say, that is not true. I say, when you look at, pull out a frame and look at it, your eye gravitates towards those individuals that are moving, not those individuals that are not. The next time you work a bee colony, pull your frame and look at how many bees are sitting there doing nothing. Everybody tells me they want their employees to be as busy as a bee. I said, I want my employees to be busier. <laughs> I don't want them sitting around resting most of the time. All right. Now, with that background, let's think about these tasks. The tasks of a worker can generally be split into four categories. Cell cleaning and capping, brood and queen tending, comb building, cleaning, and food handling, and then all the outside tasks. Think about the st step one being children, step two being uh, teenagers, step three being young adults, and step four being the older adults. That's as they age, they tend to progress 
through these tasks in a fairly predictable manner. Now, this progression, this movement through these tasks is regulated by physiology. They're hormones. There's a, especially one hormone called juvenile hormone. As they age, that level, uh, the titers or the levels of juvenile hormone increase, which pushes them from task to task to task. But they also adjust their behaviors based on colony needs and environmental conditions. There are times when it benefits a colony to have more foragers there are times when it benefits a colony to have fewer foragers. And so workers can adjust what they're doing based on feedback that they receive from their sisters while meandering about the hive. You are all probably familiar with this very gen generic um, schematic of the task of a worker honeybee. This was in Mark Winston's 1987 book, The Biology of the Honeybee. It's an incredibly famous chart and he shows kind of the task that worker bees progress through as they age. I want you to look with me at the first bar because I think everything that I've set up until this point is illustrated really well in this graphic. This is for the first task bees usually perform when they are born or emerge from a cell. They clean cells. The light bar, the thinner bar, is the average range in ages of workers that you see performing that task. So while it tends to be the first task that most workers perform, workers that are 25 days or older might be performing this task. The most common range that, of ages that workers are when they perform this task is this thicker, bold bar. The average or the mean age of workers performing this task is the little circle. So worker bees that clean cells are from zero to about 28 days old. The bulk of them do it somewhere between zero and 10 days with the average being about eight and a half days old. And what's key is as you move down this chart, that thick bold bar and the circle slowly starts to pivot to the right, showing you that older and older bees are the average bees that perform those given tasks. So again, they have a behavioral plasticity. That means that they aren't locked in to doing one thing. They don't have to move to the next thing. They can respond to colony need, but generally speaking, as they age, they tend to perform tasks that bees of that age would perform. Now, let me introduce you to those tasks because they are utterly glorious. And every task slide that I have, I will have the name of that task, in this case, cell preparation. I will have the average age range that bees are when they perform that task. In this case, they're two to 16 days old. And then I will have the mean of the bee age, the mean age of the bee performing that task. So on average, if you were to pull a random bee that is engaged in cell cleaning, she is going to be about eight days old with an average range of two to 16 days. And every task that I show you from this point forward, I'm following that format, all right? So in this first task, in cell cleaning, what you see is it will include two subcategories, polishing cells and cleaning cells. And in both cases, they are readying the cell for future use. They're trying to prepare it for whatever is going to come next. So polishing is the task that the younger bees do. Remember, there's a second category, true cleaning, and those bees do that at a slightly older age. Polishing the cell means the worker bees will go to the back of that cell and go from back to front, removing any leftover uh, debris from previous cell occupants. Now remember, I told you that a developing worker bee sheds her skin six times. She also defecates. There's also other debris in that cell. These things, these pupil cocoons, the excretia, the old leftover skins, all of that's removed. And these workers will begin to patch the walls of the cell with wax. So they're preparing that cell for more eggs or 
pollen or nectar or what have you. Then you get bees that are three to 10 days old, an average of eight days, and they are the ones that just are old enough to start capping cells. Now, worker bees' glands, wax glands, generally are not developed enough for them to be able to produce copious amounts of wax right when they emerge from their cell. But about three to 10 days old, the wax glands are just developed enough where they can start secreting small amounts of wax. And they will use these small amounts of wax to cap honey and brood cells. Capping a cell can take 20 minutes to six hours. Look at this bee here capping the cell. You can see it closing the cell right here. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful image. I just got a comment even in the uh, chat that the pictures are fantastic. Uh, let me tell you, my favorite pictures are yet to come. I, I, I can't wait to show you some of these images. All right. The next thing that we see is the workers will start feeding larvae. These are the bees we call nurse bees. Now, the reason that bees can't feed larvae the moment they emerge is the glands in their heads that produce brood food are not developed enough to where they can produce it and feed it to their offspring. They have two sets of glands in their heads, hypopharyngeal glands and mandibular glands. Don't worry about that. There is no test at the end of this talk, but, but the mixtures of the components from both sets of glands ultimately are what uh, uh, goes into brood food or royal jelly later on. Now I want you to listen to this statistic. When these worker bees are born, they eat pollen so they can develop their hypopharyngeal and mandibular glands. So they have to eat protein to develop their food glands. When those food glands are adequately developed, then they can start feeding larva. Look at that last statistic. An open larval cell may be visited 5,000 times before it is capped, with it being fed one to 2,000 of those times. A hundred plus times a day, a larva is fed. Incredible the amount of attention each individual larva receives. Can you imagine being the graduate student who had to count <laughs> all of those visits to the larva? But it's fascinating what bees do. All right. Then when they age a little bit, when they're in three to 14 day old age range, or about a mean of 11 days, they start tending the queen. We call this her retinue. Now in the United States, we don't have a queen. I know in Ireland, you don't have a queen, but your neighbors to the east still have queens. And, and I know there are some queens and kings scattered around the world. But in this case, the queen demands the attention of everyone around her. And all of those worker bees are the bees that are roughly in this age cohort, and they are licking the queen, they are feeding the queen, they are antenating the queen, they are cleaning the queen. And as they lick the queen, they're collecting her pheromones, and then they will turn around and feed one another, and that will distribute the queen's pheromones throughout the nest. And that's why the worker bees in the uppermost box can know that they have a queen, because the distribution of her pheromones is being passed from this initial cohort of individuals who's licking the queen and then turning around and passing that pheromone on to the next row of bees who in turn pass it to the next row and so forth. I love that word retinue, that circle of worker bees that collect around the queen and tend her. Next are the honey producer bees. This was my one of my favorite tasks that I, I wasn't really aware of when I was uh, doing a lot of research to develop this presentation as well as the corresponding article to which I'll reference you uh, later in this talk. So, you know, I was under the erroneous belief that when a worker laden with nectar flies back from the field and returns to the hive, she goes in the entrance of that nest and has to run to where the honey is stored, spit that nectar into cells, run all the way back down to the nest entrance and start again. But that's not the case. That's not the case. In fact, this cohort of worker bees is waiting at the nest entrance for the foragers to return. Imagine flying into Dublin, 
right when your plane lands and pulls up to the gate, all of these little vehicles come to your airplane, right, to offload the luggage and try to get your luggage to the to the uh, conveyor belt before you get to the conveyor belt. Of course, nobody is able to do that, but that's in theory how it should work. Well, that's exactly what this cohort of worker bees do. They wait at the nest entrance for workers to come in heavily laden with nectar. They collect that nectar from those foragers so the foragers can in turn go right back out. And these workers then take that nectar and deposit it into cells further in the nest. But before they do that, they do something I had never heard of until about five years ago. They have to start the evaporation of that nectar to convert it to honey. And I always knew that bees will stand at the nest entrance and fan their wings and circulate air through the nest to dry off the nectar. But I didn't know this cohort of bees starts that process by blowing nectar bubbles. They'll spit out the nectar and suck it in and spit it out and suck it in. And they'll do this over and over and over for about 20 minutes. And during that time, they're adding enzymes and they're actively dehydrating the nectar. And then they spit it up into the cells and let the ventilator bees uh, moist, uh, uh, dry it off from there. They then return back to the nest entrance and wait to offload the incoming foragers. Now, somewhere in the neighborhood of 11 to 15 days old, about a mean of 14 days, you graduate to becoming a debris cleaner. These bees are the ones that will remove spoiled pollen, wax, dead brood, dead adult bees. They're the ones who also carry off their dead, right, to borrow uh, some, a phrase from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. They will grab those dead adult worker bees and carry them off. We often call these the undertaker bees. This is the same cohort of bees that exhibits hygienic behavior. These are the ones who can detect varroa or American fowl brood or, or chalk brood, et cetera, in cells, uncapped cells, and remove the diseased or dying individual from the nest. So this is a very important cohort of bees. They help with nest um, disease and pest management. Next, we get the pollen handlers. Now, remember back to the nectar handlers. These are the bees that waited at the nest entrance, grabbed the nectar from the incoming foragers and ran it to the combs. Now, pollen handlers have a similar responsibility in that they are the first ones to process the pollen into bee bread. But they don't offload the pollen foragers at the nest entrance. The pollen foragers come back with pollen on their hind legs, like what you see here. They look for empty cells in which to deposit that pollen. And when they find an empty cell, they back their hind legs up to those cells and rake those pollen balls off of their legs and into the cell. <clears throat> at that point, the pollen handlers then go and moisten all of that pollen with nectar. They start packing that pollen in the cells and they start the conversion of that pollen over to bee bread. So they don't take it to the cells. They manipulate it once it's at the cells. And that's what distinguishes them from the nectar handlers. Then you get the bees that are comb builders. When bees are 12 to 23 days old, about an average of 16 days, their wax glands have matured sufficiently to where they can produce copious amounts of wax. We didn't take this first image. We have permission to use it, but you can see this bee has stuck her rear end up in the air and all of these wax scales are falling off the underside of her belly. She'll then take her mandibles, grab those wax cells and fashion them sorry, those wax scales and fashion them into the cells with which you and I are familiar, in which they raise their young, in which they store their pollen, in which they deposit their nectar, and so forth. Then you get bees that are performing the second half of their cell cleaning behavior. These bees will use their mandibles to restore and smooth the walls of the cells, to remove the cell cappings, and to prepare the cell for future use. It can take about 30 minutes to prepare or clean a single cell with about five to 30 worker bees helping. Now I'm going to take a deep breath and pause here for a second. I want you to think everything I've told you so far about workers. And now in your mind, compare them 
to the behaviors of a queen honeybee. Is this cell ready for an egg? Yes, it is. Back up my rear end, lay an egg. Is this cell ready for an egg? Yes, it is. Back up my rear end, lay an egg. In contrast, think about everything the worker bees have done until this point, and I've not even told you the cool behaviors yet. So let's move forward and think about this. About this point, somewhere of an average of about 19 days, worker bees start migrating from in the hive tasks to out of the hive tasks. And the first out of the hive task they will do is ventilate the nest. These are the bees who stand at the nest entrance in this incredibly characteristic pose. All of their legs will be on the ground. They'll stick their abdomen up in the air and they will fan their wings. You can see this bee here doing it. Her rear end's up in the air and she's fanning her wings. Depending on the direction that those bees at the nest entrance are, are, is facing, they can direct air into the nest or out of the nest. And they are obviously responsible for thermoregulating the nest when it is hot, but also evaporating the moisture off of nectar to convert it to honey. Hundreds of bees might perform this task at any given time. I think, I'm not sure, but I think this is probably my favorite image in the whole presentation. And that's because the very next task that bees do is they become guard bees. They're usually around 19 days old, about 5 to 28 days. Guard bees have the most characteristic pose of all the bees. You can tell with certainty when a bee is a guard bee. She'll be at the nest entrance. Her back four legs will be on the ground. Her front two legs will be in the air. Her mandibles will be open. Her antenna will be rigid. It's almost like she's saying, come on, sucker. I'm ready to take you on, right? Look at her. She, I mean, imagine being the size of a bee and landing on the nest of a bee, and that's what you see while you're trying to go in. And as worker bees land on the nest entrance, this bee will reach out with her front two legs, with her antenna. She'll smell that bee, and if it's a bee from her colony, she'll permit it to go in. If not, she'll attack it. This bee is making that stance. This bee is making that stance. This bee is making that stance. I just love it because it's about as threatening as a bee can look. Legs up, mandibles open, just inviting conflict. I love that characteristic guard pose. These are the bees that will meet you at the nest entrance when you cut your grass too close to the nest. And then they start migrating from colony behaviors, either inside or outside the colony, to fully away from the colony behaviors. They'll start taking their first orientation flights when they're about 17 to 27 days old. And these are the flights to just figure out where my home is in context of the surrounding environment. Where is home? It's by this tree. It's by the fence. It's by this house. It's by this shrub. You know, where is my home in context? Because remember, this bee now is going to fly, you know, many miles, maybe two, three, four, five miles or, or up to eight kilometers away from its nest. So it's got to go away and be able to find its way back. So this is the age that bees start taking orientation flights. These usually alarm the willies out of a beekeeper. A beekeeper might go in the early afternoon and see hundreds or thousands of bees flying around the nest entrance and think that their colony is about to swarm, when in reality, it's just the newest crop of graduates who are trying to figure out where the house is before they become foraging bees. Which leads me to the last of the structured behaviors that we see worker bees do, and that's foraging. This is the job that will kill the worker honeybee if she makes it this far. Usually they're about 18 to 28 days old, a mean of about 24 days. I want you to look at some of these stats. On average, a worker bee will only be a forager for four to five days. That's about all their little bodies can take. Before they die, they will have flown about 500 miles. 
When they leave the nest, they're collecting nectar that you now know they use to convert to honey or pollen that they use for bee bread. They might collect water, which I love this image from Mike Bentley. What do you think about this? He caught a bee collecting water on a thin film of water. So you can see the, the mirrored image of the bee in the water. I love this image. So it's collecting water to take back to the nest for thermoregulation purposes. And then the fourth thing that bees collect when they're away from the hive they collect tree saps and rosins, which they convert to what we beekeepers affectionately call propolis. Now, these are the behaviors that they introduce you to in that structured schematic that I showed you earlier. But there's a lot of other things that worker bees do that don't always fit so nicely into that structure. For example, worker bees will beard when it's really hot outside and it's your colony is strong and the nest is congested and it's a summer evening late. In order to keep the nest temperatures cooler, the bees might cluster on the nest entrance at nighttime to keep from overheating in that nest and overheating the brood. We call this bearding because when it's hot enough and enough bees do it, it will be almost like your hive has a beard. This is kind of a weak example of that, but you can see how a beard is just starting to form. Every summer in Florida, I get emails and phone calls from panicked beekeepers who are worried that their bees are doing something out of the ordinary when it's really just bearding. Worker honeybees are also able to thermoregulate. They can keep the nest cool when it's hot and warm when it's cool. Right In winter, they cluster together. In summer, they spread apart and fan and bring in water and sprinkle droplets around the nest. What an amazing series of behaviors thermoregulation is. Worker bees can even lay eggs. In an example, when a colony goes queenless, if they fail to requeen themselves, workers can begin laying eggs. Now workers can't mate. And because they can't mate, they can only lay unfertilized eggs, which we all know because of haplodiploidy, they can only produce males. Now there is one honeybee out there whose workers can lay unfertilized eggs and produce females. But you'll have to invite me to Ireland to give a talk on that bee. We must progress. Worker bees can patrol. They're walking around the nest to try to figure out what needs to be done, what tasks are underperformed, what needs are in the nest. And of course, worker bees can exhibit a defensive response. Yes, it is the guard bee that does this more often, but all worker honeybees, or at least worker honeybees that are about two days old or older, are capable of stinging. Now, if you've enjoyed some of those other images, look at this one. This is the sting of a worker honeybee in all of its glory. In fact, I give a talk on stings and how they work. Usually by the time I'm done, everybody in the audience is just wanting to run outside and get themselves stung just so they can see this mechanism in action. Of course, I'm speaking tongue in cheek here, but the sting is a marvelous defensive mechanism, right? Don't you wish you could sting people that made you upset? And in this case, what you have is multiple parts of a sting. You've got the shaft, the pointy end that goes into the body, but in reality, it is so small that you don't feel it. What you really feel from the sting is the venom produced by these spaghetti-like glands that collects in this venom sac that this set of muscles right here pumps from the venom sac through this muscular bulb, through the shaft, and into your body. I don't have a lot of time to explain how all of this happens, but I wanted you to see the marvelous thing in all of its glory from the glands that make the venom to the sac that stores it to the muscles that push it into you through the shaft that delivers it to the site where you are stung. And stings are more amazing than I've even told you now, but I'll just let them rest at this point. Then, as I've mentioned, a lot of workers simply rest. They do nothing at all. Sleep is important for everything, so worker bees do it. There is another behavior that worker bees might do, and that's robbing, where during certain times of the year when there are nectar dearths, bees from strong colonies might go to weaker colonies, try to infiltrate their nest and steal their nectar or honey 
to return it back to their old hive. If you think about it, think about it just as a scientist, robbing must be a huge energetic cost for the colony that is engaged in the behavior. Think about it. If you have two colonies in your backyard, all the honey you need is potentially right next door to you. Why forage over a 200 square kilometer area when you can just go one meter to your left and take all the honey that you need? But bees typically only engage in robin behavior when there's no forage available in the environment. And that's probably because there's a significant energetic cost <clears throat> of fighting your way into a neighboring hive and stealing its honey and making it back. There's probably a lot of personnel costs. A lot of bees end up dead doing this. Otherwise, bees wouldn't have to forage. They just steal from one another. But nevertheless, there are times of the year that resources are in great demand, even though they are in low supply. So in that those times of the year, worker bees will engage a robbing behavior. Worker bees will often groom, also groom. That's comb their bodies. It's, it's their equivalent of taking a shower. They'll lick themselves, they'll lick their siblings, they'll lick their queens to remove pests, debris, etc. They will engage in trophallaxis. That's just a fancy term for feeding one another. In this case, this bee has all the nectar it needs plus some. These two bees are hungry, so they antenated with the bee that has the nectar, and this bee begins to regurgitate nectar so that these two can then take it from the one with nectar. How do I know these two are the ones being fed? Because they have their tongues extended to the mouth parts of this bee. This social exchange of food is called trophallaxis. It's a fancy way of saying bees feeding one another. Now, I've talked to you a lot about individual bee behaviors, cleaning, grooming, trophallaxis, stinging, etc. Just a couple of slides on group behaviors. Probably one of the best books written about swarming. Well, let's just reset that statement. The best book I've ever seen about swarming is, of course, Tom Seeley's Honeybee Democracy. Swarming behavior is an incredible behavior. In swarming behavior, the worker bees time a release from their parental hive. They coalesce or form a bivouac on a tree or something like this. They send scouts out to canvas the countryside to look for new nest sites. They go into those nest sites, measure various parameters about those nest sites, come back to this cluster and dance to communicate their findings to this cluster. When this cluster has voted on a nest site that it wants to inhabit, they collectively release from the tree limb, etc., and they fly in mass to their new nest site. This is an incredibly complex series of behaviors that worker bees control. And there's all of these different parts of swarming that worker bees find themselves doing throughout all of this. And of course, how can we talk about worker honeybees if we don't talk about their famous dances? To make worker bees even more complex and beautiful than everything I've told you thus far, they can communicate the direction, the distance, and the quality of forage to their sisters by dancing. Just by dancing. If they do this round dance, the food source is within about 15 meters. It's a directionless dance. It just contributes. Uh, it just um, um, tells a bit about the quality of the food resource. But as, of course, you all know the famous ones, the figure eight dance, where there's a straight run in the figure eight dance and the bee goes to the right, and then a straight run in the figure eight dance and the bee goes to the left, straight run right, straight run left. And the direction of that straight run relative to up on the comb is the direction of the food resource relative to the sun. So if she's dancing straight up in her run, the food source is directly in line with the sun away from the hive. If she's dancing 45 degrees to the right of up, the food source is 45 degrees to the right of the sun. 
not only can bees dance to communicate this, bees can watch these dances and receive that information. What's even crazier is let's say for the sake of argument that a bee has gone out and flown you know, a few kilometers away and foraged and she flies a few kilometers back. Let's just say it takes her 15 minutes to get back to the hive. By the time she offloads her nectar, and begins to dance, let's just say it's 20 minutes. So if she's using the sun to orient to that food source, she's dancing for a food source. The earth has spun in those 20 minutes. The sun is no longer at the same angle to the food than it was 20 minutes ago. But she's able to compensate for that in her dance, the bees watching the dance who then, if they receive the information as early as they can, are flying to a food source that's no longer at the same angle because the sun, you know, the earth is turned, so it's given the appearance that the sun has moved 20 more minutes, and the bee interpreting that dance can calculate that distance change. And they use the sun to orient, but what happens on cloudy days when there is no sun to see? Well, those three small eyes between their two large eyes, those three small eyes can pick up different wavelengths of light so that they can even see the sun on a cloudy day. Boys and girls, I think you will agree with me that the worker honeybee is fascinating. She is the most underappreciated bee because she, there's so many of her. We laud the queen. We're maybe even intrigued by the drones. But the worker honeybees are the ones that are just stunningly diverse in their behavior, their activity, their intent, their purpose. And what's more, every one of them could have been a queen. I hope you've enjoyed my talk on worker honeybee behaviors. What I'd like you to do, I'm, I'm going to speak for about five more minutes before I invite questions from the audience. What I'd like to do is just hunker down on this slide for just a few minutes, because what I'd love you to do is take a screenshot of this slide or use your camera and take a picture of this slide, because I would invite you, every one of you, to follow my lab on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at UF Honeybee Lab. You can find me and my team at UF Honeybee Lab. Here's my lab uh, web address. I'm going to show you how to find that in a moment. Here's my email address. If you have questions, comments, queries, conundrums, or quandaries, you can email me and I will do my best to help you. So again, try to take a quick screenshot of this. I'm going to take it down in about 10 seconds because I want to show you how to find the document that I referred you to earlier. It's basically a summary of everything I've told you. So for about five more seconds, I'll leave this up. All righty-o, I'm taking it down. And what I'm going to do instead is bring up a, a, a Google page. If you cannot see my search engine that says Google, if uh, the host will let me know, that way I'll make sure that you're all seeing what I'm seeing. Yeah, but I'm hope you. perfect. I hope you all see the word Google. I work for the University of Florida. And I work with honeybees. So if you Google University of Florida honeybees, again, if you Google University of Florida honeybees and press enter, the very first option that you are going to get is going to be my lab, the Honeybee Research and Extension Lab. But it's easy enough to just remember I work for the University of Florida honeybees. Click on that link and you'll go to my lab's page. Before I go any further, I want to tell you specifically how to find that document. I'm going to scroll down to the button that says Beekeeper Resources, Beekeeper Resources. So I click on Beekeeper Resources. The topic that I just gave you on honeybee behaviors is a topic in the subject honeybee biology. So if you click on honeybee biology, you will see a lot of documents that I have written on honeybee biology. The one that's relevant to this talk is Tasks of a Worker Honeybee. 
basically everything I just showed you, and including a lot of those images, is summarized in the document. You can see a lot of other things that I mentioned here, mating biology, thermoregulation of the dance language, the staying superorganism concept, etc. But again, the summary of my talk is here, tasks of a worker honeybee. What I'd like to do is go back and tell you that's not all we offer on our website. We have all kinds of documents, videos, et cetera, on all types of topics and subjects on beekeeping. And as I go back to my homepage, I want to point out right here at the top is a scrolling marquee that highlights some of our newest developments. For example, my team and I have just started a new podcast on honeybees and beekeeping. We call it Two Bees in a Podcast. So Two Bees in a Podcast. If you click on Two Bees in a Podcast, you'll see every episode that we've released so far this year. I know you might think, since I am in Florida and working in Florida, that it's going to be very US-centric, but it's not. We interview beekeepers and bee scientists from all over the world about bee topics that are relevant to beekeepers all over the world. We already have listeners from 50 plus countries all over the world. So it, we, we believe, we, and we're getting really good feedback and it's free. So all of you can listen to podcasts. You can find them on our website. Every podcast has two segments usually one where I'm talking about management with my co-host and usually a second where we're interviewing. And the third segment, we answer questions submitted by our audience. So on our Twitter account or Facebook account or Instagram account, you can submit questions that will become the questions that we answer at the end of our podcast episodes. So if you look and are curious about what episodes we have so far, you can listen. You can see the Q&A, you can see who we interviewed, and you can see additional notes and resources relative to the topic that we were talking about at the end. So for example, the very last one we had is very relevant to you because we interviewed Dr. Ashley Mortensen from New Zealand. She was talking about drone congregation areas. We interviewed Dr. Raffaele D'Aulio from Italy talking about queen breeding programs across Europe. So all of our episodes, we try to put something in there for everybody. So again, there's all of that. And, and I know I, I don't wanna spend too much time boring you with these resources, but we also have an online educational program that we call our Master Beekeeper Program. And our Master Beekeeper Program, we believe is the most structured online beekeeping educational program on planet Earth. By the time we are finished, we, we've got two levels up online completely. By the time we are finished, there will be over 200 different lectures on all things honeybees with no two lectures being the same. So every topic we could think of about honeybees, we worked with professional adult online education specialists to develop a master beekeeper program with four levels that's got dozens of modules, hundreds of lectures, supplementary material, videos, all kinds of information that anybody on planet Earth can take. A lot of people don't like to access our information through the master beekeeper program because they, they don't want that kind of formal structured system where we have expectations. And we are currently repackaging all of our modules and providing access to individual modules. Perhaps you don't want to go through the Master Beekeeper program. You only want information on Varroa. So you will be able to access just our lectures on Varroa. Perhaps you don't want to go through the Master Beekeeper program. You're only interested in honeybee biology. We'll have all of our lectures from honeybee biology topics across all four levels of our program squeezed into one module that will outside of the Master Beekeeper program be available to beekeepers around the world. So to find out about all of these things and then so much more, follow us on all our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook accounts. Visit our website as frequently as you like. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put back up the last slide that I showed you. And now I'm going to attempt to answer some of your questions. All right, if you have questions, 
drop them in the chat box. I'm going to try to keep up with all of this because they're really starting to roll in now. All right. Is queen pheromone airborne or only pass from B to B? It is both volatile and topical. So they can pass it by touching it and moving it around and by uh, smelling it with their antenna. So it is both volatile and topical. Let's see here. Do all social insects, for example, ants follow the temporal polyethism model? Great question. The answer is no. There are some, in fact, the, in fact, honeybees are, are kind of the exception. Most social insects will have um, individuals who are kind of born into that task. They're soldier ants or ants that take care of the babies and that's all they do. What I will tell you that's really interesting though is that all, okay, remember, so, so they don't all engage in temporal polyethism. I kind of just answered that quickly. Honeybees do, but most, many other social insects don't. All right. With that said, honeybees belong to, you know, they're bees. Be bees belong to the order of insects called hymenoptera. That's Greek. Hymen means membrane. Optera means wings, so membranous wings. All hymenoptera have a haplodiploid sex determinant system. So all bee, wasp, and ant males are haploid. All bee, wasp, and ant females are diploid. So all bee, wasp, and ants have haploid, diploid, sex determinant systems, but they don't all engage in temporal polyethism. All right. Let's see here. I don't see any other questions. You guys are making it easy. The, quest the questions are in the Q&A block. Okay, that's the problem. I'm seeing in the chat box and not the Q&A. Okay. Ah, there we go. All right. I've got a Q&A and a chat box, and so I was seeing them in the chat. Perfect. What do the youngest bees do with the pupil skins and excretia? They, they remove it from the hive, but there's no doubt a little bit of cannibalism that happens with it because, um, but, but for the most part, it's, it's thrown out of the hive. All right. I often see small groups. Let's see here. I often see small groups or pairs of bees on the outside of the hive or nest entrance touching or gathering around each other. Is this grooming behavior? Good question. If they are touching one another uh, and licking one another, then it's grooming behavior. But a lot of people, what they're seeing at the nest entrance is a behavior that I failed to put in this presentation that now two people have pointed out to me and I need to retroactively do this. And it's a behavior called washboarding where bees stand on the nest entrance and they're kind of front, their, their back four legs are anchored on the face of the hive and they kind of rock back and forth while they use their antenna and front pair of legs to kind of touch the hive. And a lot of people think that they were cleaning hives and there's been huge debates on what washboarding is, but now, and again, it's still up in the air, but now some of the best evidence suggests that it's spreading uh, the colony's odor on the entrance to the nest to make it easier for subsequent workers to find it. All right, my dad lives in Southern Georgia near Brunswick. Could you recommend a reputable nuke producer or queen breeder in the region? Local, local bees are best, right? Well, it's interesting that your dad lives in Southern Georgia near Brunswick. I am from Georgia myself. That's why I've got such a thick Southern accent. If you email me uh, behind the scenes, I'll point you in the right direction from some of the local queen and nuke producers in the area because there's a lot in that area. So, so good question. It's neat to see that, that one of your parents lives in, in the state from which I hail. All right, can you say something about full sisters and half sister worker bees? and how they interact with each other. Ooh, I love the questions you guys ask. Now, honeybees, as is pointed out by Pat in this question, all the worker honeybees in a nest share the same mama, but they don't share the same father. Let's pretend that a queen mates with exclusively 10 males. That means the worker bees have two, any two worker bees you randomly pull from the comb will have the same mo mother, but there's only a one in 10 chance that they have the same father. As a result of this, there is likely some small, probably measurable, but small conflict in the nest. There are some subspecies of Apis mellifera where this conflict is very pronounced, such as Cape honeybees in South Africa, 
where some of these subfamilies might go after one another or actually police the eggs laid by uh, another worker and remove eggs uh, in favor of the production of eggs from their own mothers. So half sisters and full sisters probably, even if small, have some measurable behavioral interactions that differ, but in a queen right colony that is functioning normally, those differences are pretty minimal. When the colony goes queenless, that is probably where you see these kind of petroline conflicts popping up even more. But even still in our European subspecies of honeybees, I suspect it's pretty minimal. It seems to be more of a common thing in African subspecies of honeybees. I listen to your podcast and very much enjoy it. Hey, great. You, you're now my favorite person listening to my Q&A now. No, I'm just kidding. Of course, I like all of you, but thank you for that comment. I hope it's, hope it's useful to you. All right. Love your two bees in a podcast. Great. That's perfect. Two, two different people said that. It must be good. Three different people say it. All right. I'm really enjoying the one on varroa sensitive hygiene, varroa tolerance, and queen rearing episode. Thank you for dedicating your time to making them. So guys, check out our podcast. I promise that there's stuff relevant to beekeepers all around the world. It's great to get this feedback from, from beekeepers in Ireland. My bees were bearding the other day and it's quite cold here. All right, there's always curveballs to be thrown. So there's a few things that can lead to this. Number one, the nest could be congested. I don't know what uh, uh, Pauline, what temperatures kind of led up to cold. Maybe they were clustering and then it got cold. Uh, like I said, sometimes it's congestion um, and sometimes it's just unexplainable. And if, it, and, if, and if they truly initiated a beard during a time that it was cold, I, I would struggle to offer an explanation for that. So I'll, if I see one, I'll make sure and share it with your host to be able to distribute, but that's, that's an interesting observation. How is varroa sensitive hygiene determined by the bees through epigenetics? Is this something being manipulated by the beekeeper scientists rather than the bees or both love the podcast? All right, varroa sensitive hygiene. Varroa sensitive hygiene is a really interesting behavior where worker bees can detect not just varroa present in cap cells, but varroa that are actually reproducing. Think about it, it's energetically more beneficial for them only to uncap and address reproducing varroa because those are the ones that can put, cause the most damage. Varroa that aren't reproducing, there's no reason to uncap those cells because it's kind of a dead end. And some breeders at the USDA lab in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, discovered varroa sensitive hygiene. They originally called it suppressed mite reproduction, but now it's kind of the acronym VSH. And what they've shown is that bees, that, that VSH is just a unique hygienic response where the worker bees can detect under a cap cell reproducing varroa and remove it. So to answer your question, people are searching for the genes right now to see if it's what, what in the world is, what, what, are, what are the genes governing this behavior? It is likely not epigenetic. It is likely just the presence or absence of certain genes. Um, not all the worker bees, for example, uh, dis uh, ex display hygienic behavior equally. It is likely, and, I, and I'm not a geneticist, but I'm just going to put my two cents in here. It is likely that hygienic behavior is controlled by multiple genes. So probably having more of these will make you more hygienic and vice versa. That is my guess what they're going to find, but the jury is still out um, uh, on that question, but that's a good question. Is onset of winter bees due to pollen resources declining or, or length of daylight or other factors? So G. Butler asked that question. I love these questions. This question is good because 10 years ago, I never heard anybody talk about winter bees. Now winter bees are the thing to talk about. So what is a winter bee? In advance of winter, colonies began investing in the production of winter bees. Now, there's nothing overly unique about them. They have the same genes that summer and spring worker bees have. So, but these bees are physiologically different than their spring and summer worker counterparts. They're fatter. They have more fat bodies. They live longer because they can live many months to carry colonies through winter. They don't have... 
They don't tend to engage in all of those behaviors. We don't know if it's because they can't or because they're not afforded the opportunity to, right? You can't forage in winter. So there is a ton of research happening right now to decipher what triggers the production of winter bees uh, in lieu of summer bees. So we don't know the answer. So I'm going to tell you my guess, if, if I were studying this, I would hypothesize that shortening daylight, cooler temperatures, and, limit, and, and lower resources collectively trigger the focus on the production of winter bees to the exclusion of summer bees. I think an equally good question is, what makes one a winter bee or a summer bee? But prevailing data right now suggests that it's food, right? That, that's what we would think. But again, the jury is still out on that. This is such a new topic that people are trying to answer these very questions as you ask them. So great, great, great question. What signals the worker bees to decide to supersede? Is it a lack of pheromone or is it something else like a lack of brood? Andrew, it's both. Sometimes they'll initiate the supersedure process because the queen may be old and she might be laying really well. But if she's producing uh, lower amounts of pheromones, the bees don't know she's there and they will start to try to supersede her. Sometimes it's less brood when they feel like there could be that there's enough resources to support ample brood production. Bees also seem to be able to detect, uh, uh, be able to detect that the queen is maimed in some way. So maybe the queen is damaged, in which case they will supersede. So certainly there's a few different triggers that can lead to this. All right, let's see here. Flying bees returning to the hive commonly bump into you if you're standing close by almost as if they don't see you, since you in their flight path, despite their extraordinary ability to find a patch of tiny path of forage. Any explanation? Yeah, I think they're just simply moving too fast to get out of the way, right? They, they've got this kind of one focus. They're going, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, they're going to where their hive should be and you just got in the flight path. I, I think that's the simple explanation. If something else is to be found in the future regarding this, I, I will change my answer, but I think it's just you inadvertently getting in the flight path and, and their little tiny brains being unable to alter their flight to respond appropriately. How much time do worker bees spend doing nothing? You know, Claire, I've seen it be as much as 90% reported in the literature. So I'm going to back up from that and say it's probably somewhere between 50 to 80% of the time. New beekeeper here, Jamie. There was a condensation in the bee candy container when I changed it yesterday. All right. So we don't use bee candy much in southern states in the U.S. That typically is a, a colder climate here. But as bees consume honey, they um, um, release moisture, S especially when a hive environment's closed and there's low airflow, which it oftentimes is when preparing for winter. Bees can consume honey and release so much moisture that you can get a condensation buildup on the underside of the lid that will rain back down on the bees. So if you're getting condensation on bee candy, a lot of it has to do with just uh, insufficient ventilation and, and the moisture that bees are producing as they consume honey. Some of my colonies stop rearing bees early autumn, like September, just at the time when you expect winter bees to be produced. They get through winter okay. Does this mean there's some plasticity between nursed young bees and winter bees? It's possibly the case, or I would argue they started producing winter bees earlier than you believe them to be. Some of the papers that I've seen say that they start producing winter bees as early as July and August. And incidentally, guys, that's why varroa control is so important because bees are producing their winter bees usually when the peak varroa populations are in your colonies. That's why varroa control, June, July, August, September. That's the time to make sure varroa is under control because that's when bees are starting to invest so heavily in the production of those bees that are going to carry your colonies through winter. All right. How much do worker bees sleep in the hive and is the hive completely dark inside? How do they see each other, especially during the waggle dance? You are bringing up the age old debate. So number one, how much do worker bees sleep in the hive? I'll say between 50 and you know 80% of the time. It's not really sleep, it's just kind of rest, but, but nevertheless, it's, that's the point. 
And how can they see in a dark hive to see the waggle dance? That's great. That truly created a huge debate in the 70s and 80s. When Carl von Frisch said that the waggle dance is how bees communicate food resources to a hive, an American scientist in California said hogwash, the hive is too dark, there's no way the worker bees can see that. And he said it's principally scent, that during the dance the bees are giving food that they collected to their worker sisters, they smell like the food resource, and that is what the worker bees find. The truth is, it's a little bit of both. Scent is involved, uh, dance is involved, but let me answer your question specifically. You don't have to see the dance to receive information from it. If you watch a dance, a lot of worker bees are actually following the dancing bee in her motion. They are spinning around with her as she dances. And that's one of the ways that they're receiving information. They're recreating the dance. They're learning the angle, as it were. They're also receiving information through smell, as I've just said, and they're receiving information through the vibrations that the dancing bee emits through the wax. Any Florida beekeepers experimenting, let's see here. Any Florida beekeepers experimenting with not treating for Varroa? Yes, there are some Florida beekeepers and U.S. beekeepers who do this. They obviously have a lot of high losses uh, for some years before it seems to level off. But yes, there are beekeepers who are trying that. But have I heard anything about natural Varroa treatments? So, you know, I'm not sure what you mean by that question. So I'm going to go off on a few tangents. If you mean natural Varroa treatments in, in things like botanical uh, extracts like eucalyptol or thymol or menthol or camphor. I would say I know a lot about that. If you mean natural in the sense that behaviors that bees engaged in to limit varroa populations, I know a bit about that. If you are talking about things that bees may collect themselves in an effort to fight varroa, uh, I know a, a teeny little bit about that. So um, Usually when people say natural treatments, they basically mean not the synthetic pesticides, usually the, the botanical extracts. And so what I usually encourage people to do is use um, products that exist. There are a lot of products that use essential oils that have been registered and tested. A lot of these are safe for bees and, and useful against Varroa. Does air pollution have an effect on the orientation of the honeybee? I do not know the answer to that question. My guess is yes, if it's significant, um, but, but I, I'm not aware of any studies looking at that. That's cool. I wonder if a lower sun helps signal winter brood production. Hey, great question, Isaac. My guess is, is that there's a handful of factors that collectively contribute to that. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if a, if a lowering sun, shorter days, et cetera, collectively contribute to that. All right, let's see here. Does Apis, I tell you what, this will be my last question. That way, that way we can, uh, I, I can let you guys go and you can have your nice evenings. And, um, but this is a good question to end on. Let's see here from Northern Ireland. Do, does Apis mellifera scutellata cause a problem in Florida? All right, so let me, let me answer that question uh, for you guys. So there is one honeybee, right? There's one honeybee whose natural distribution is outside of Asia. So just for fun, I'm going to tell you that there's nine species of honeybees on planet Earth. There are the giant honeybees, Apis laboriosa and Apis dorsata. There's the dwarf honeybees, Apis andriniformis and Apis florea. And then there's the five cavity nesting bees, Apis serrata, Apis kashevnikovi, Apis nuluensis, Apis nigrosincta, and everybody's favorite, Apis, Apis mellifera. So Apis mellifera, that's the bee you guys have. That's the bees we have. That bee is naturally distributed in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa, maybe even in Western Asia. That bee has different races, just like there are different races of humans. There are different races of Apis mellifera. And one of those races, Apis mellifera scutellata, that is the bee from Africa brought to Central Amer or South America in the 1950s. It is the bee affectionately known as the African bee 
or what the press calls the killer bee. This bee is present in throughout South America, Central America, and now the Southwestern US. It is also present in the Southern half of the state of Florida. And yes, to answer your question, we do have issues with African bees in the state of Florida. It, they they uh, can infiltrate our colonies. Our virgin queens can intermate with the drones uh, and become Africanized colonies themselves. They sting animals and people. So yes, we have had some problems. So what I wanna do now is I just wanna spend a second thanking you for your attention. You have put up with my accent and my nonsense now for about an hour and a half. Uh, I really appreciate your attention. I really hope to be able to see you guys again someday. I've, remember, we've got 200 presentations that we can share with you. So thank you for having me this evening. If you have more questions, don't hesitate to post it on our social media accounts or email me. I'll do the best I can to help you guys out. Thank you again for having me. And I just really appreciate the invitation and being able to spend your evening with you. Thank you so very much. And I'll turn it back over to your host. Okay. Thank you, Jamie. I think I speak for everyone that, where we, where I say it was absolutely excellent. Um, you know, especially all the extra stuff that you have on your website. You know, that's really useful. I'm sure I spent hours uh, chewing through that. So I'll just, I think I'll just end it here and let you get back to your day. And thank you very much again. And hopefully we'll see you again here. Thank you, everyone. You all take care. Happy beekeeping. Bye-bye.